How many people would like to hear God talking about talking to angels about you? How many people would like to hear what he said? Yes. Yeah, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well then, um, uh, Mark Verkler, come on up and show us the way, brother. Thank you very much. Good evening, folks. It's good to be in the presence of God. Amen. I feel like rambling for a few minutes, which is something a teacher never does. So if I actually pull this off, it's going to be a miracle, all right? So um, while I ramble, I know they got pencil and paper to pass out to you because you're all going to need pencil and paper. So let me ramble, and you pass out pencil and paper to anyone who doesn't have pencil and paper because I will get into teaching in a few minutes, and you will need paper for that. Cause, uh, so uh, if you need pencil or paper, raise your hand if you would. And uh, as I'm sharing a few stories here, you, they can just get, put some things in your hand. I was on my way back from, uh, on my way, yeah, just uh, take a few people and just pass, take it back to them. Yeah, take it back to them, okay, because uh, they don't want to come up here. They'll, all right, so if they got their hand up, just give them a sheet. I came back from Israel last week. I was spent last weekend, uh, tel last weekend in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem. We set up a Bible school there, Supernatural College of Theology, Jerusalem. <laughs> Hallelujah, Supernatural College, all right. Had a chance to train some young people, adults and kids, how to journal. Got some shots of me laying on the floor with some kids who are about five to seven years old. I said, look, if you can't write yet, just draw pictures of where Jesus is at and where he, you're at and what he's saying, what he's doing. They did. They shared their stories of what Jesus was saying. It was fun. It was great. It's my first time to go to Jerusalem. It was a wonderful time. I'll share about it in my newsletter next month. So um, once a month, we send out an email newsletter. You can sign up on a table out back if you're interested. Give us an email address. And, and I'll share my own reflections as I came back, as I was there in, in Jerusalem. On the way back, I met with a rabbi. He was in a plane, and I strike up conversations with people just to see where they're at and see what we can share. And, and he was, he's a teacher. He was coming here to America to teach, and I said, well, I'm a teacher too, and talked about his work. And, and I said, uh, I teach people how to hear God's voice, which kind of made him interested. And we chatted for a few minutes about that, and then I was going to pull out a card, because we have a little card on, uh, I don't know where it is. Here it is. It's... Uh, Four Keys to Hearing God's Voice. We got hundreds of those in the back back there. And I said, you know, if you'd like a card, I'd be glad to give it to you. And it was amazing, the fear and terror that showed up in that guy's face. And he backed away and said, no, you know. And I thought, okay, whatever, you know. They don't all respond well to the card. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, and that's fine. So I thought, well, here's my chance to plant a seed. I said, you know what? The difference between the God that you worship and the God that the nations around you worship is that your God lives and their God is dead and your God speaks and that's what makes you stand out as being different from all the religions around you and I just left it there it's a seed man it, I hope it stirs them up and makes them realize man that is our unique difference and I really ought to be listening and hearing my God all right so um, sometimes people take the card in the airport uh, uh, an uh, elevator. Here's a person with a hand up. Are you looking for a sheet of paper by any chance? Here's another girl right here who needs a sheet of paper. So make sure you get her one. There's one right there if you want to grab one. That'll right, the, right up here on the right up here. You can grab that sheet. All right. I was on an um, elevator going up in the oh, got in the motel a couple weeks ago. Got talking to a guy. Asked him what he did. He was there for the athletic competition. He asked what I was doing. I said oh, I teach people how to hear God's voice. He said really. I said, yeah, would you like a card? He said, I'd love one. So I gave him a card with a four keys and a website address where you get an hour of free teaching. So you get different responses. How many know different responses are okay, amen? You just plant a seed and whatever works out. And there's hundreds of these out there. So feel free to help yourself if you'd like to have something to put in people's hands. So uh, there I've rambled. How's that? That's, that's amazing. Teachers don't ramble. I want you to know. Teachers, you know. So you've just witnessed a miracle. I think it's because I'm 60. When you hit 60, you're free to ramble at that point in time, don't you think? Yeah. Oh, I also wanted to share, I really enjoyed the dancing that was here up front, all right? I just think it's great. Some people can actually do more than the Pentecostal hop, you know? I can, I can, that's about all I can do, you know? And it looked like ballet to me, and I was pretty impressed. So, uh, because, you know, there before the throne, how many of you know there's a whole lot of really amazing stuff going on there, amen? And people who can pictorially put that in a dance, I think it's beautiful. And it helps draw me on in. So I, I enjoyed seeing that. So uh, that was wonderful. 
had a chance to talk to a few people before the service, and uh, that was good too. One lady said she learned how to journal last time I was here, and she began journaling on scripture verses. She'd read a verse, she'd journal about it, and uh, she happened to meet a guy who was kind of, his faith was wounded, he kind of suffered some shipwreck of faith, and so every morning she kind of sent him out uh, the scripture verse she med meditated on and the journaling she did about it, uh, did about that verse, and she did that for several months, and his faith was restored by her sharing that with him. How many think that's nice, amen? Yeah, go ahead, give the Lord a hand. I think that's great, all right? Because how many know that's the voice of God is about the only thing that will resurrect and restore nations or people, amen? Amen. It's amazing to me that we can be so convinced that God doesn't speak. One of the authors I, re I read years ago, he said, from the most liberal demythalizers to the most conservative fundamentalists, they're all equally convinced that God has no living encounter with mankind. And I thought, really? I'm in the same camp as a liberal demythalizer because I don't believe God speaks. And I was. I'd have never thought I was in the same camp, but I was. And where did that ever come from? Well, it came from Thomas Aquinas in 1200 A.D. Uh, he was a theologian in the, in the church in, the, in that age, Middle Ages. And he wrote, scholastic, he wrote out a theory of, of theology and philosophy which introduced scholasticism to the church, where we approach God mentally. And he spent his entire life writing many, many, many books. He got all done. Three months before he died, the Lord gave him a triple dream experience, three dreams. And he realized God was speaking to him through the, through the dreams, and of course they did not fit into scholasticism because they're direct spirit-to-spirit -spirit encounter, and it completely revolutionized him. And the people said, encouraged him, his friends encouraged him to write about it, and he said, no. He said, uh, everything I have written appears as straw, and I can write no more. And within three months he was dead. But we took what he thought was straw and we made it the approach that Christianity has used for many, many years. So we're breaking out of that approach. God's doing something new today. This church is an example of that. And uh, we're helping people break out and give them an introduction to how to hear God's voice. So tonight we're going to introduce how to hear God's voice. Um, some of you have heard this before. How many have heard it before? Come on, wave your hand at me so I can see how many have heard it. How many have not heard it before, haven't heard me teach any four keys? All right, so a bunch of you are new. So um, for me, it was hard to hear God's voice. I got saved in a church that didn't believe God was speaking. And uh, they didn't help me at all. And uh, I left that church pretty quickly uh, because I really hungered to hear God's voice. I joined, joined the charismatic church and I asked them. I said, hey, how do you hear God's voice? And they didn't help me at all either. They just said, well, you know that you know that you know. And I said, you know what? <laughs> I wouldn't be asking if I knew, now would I? So um, I got very angry over that answer. And I actually went ahead and backslid. But the problem with being a preacher and backsliding is you've got to get right with God every Friday night so you can get a sermon for Sunday. So you can only backslide five days in a row, you know. So, um, but I actually backslid two, three times over the whole thing because I would ask people how to hear God's voice, people who should know, and they couldn't tell me. That was so infuriating to me that no one could simply say, hey, look, God's voice sounds like spontaneous thoughts that light up on your mind. Simple sentence. Let's say it together. God's voice sounds like spontaneous thoughts that light up on your mind. No one could spit that out of their mouth. And I'm, now you can spit it out of your mouth. You just spoke it. It's here on the cards, and uh, we're going to spend all day tomorrow deepening an understanding of four simple keys that God taught me to hear his voice. That's one of the four, that his voice sounds like a spontaneous thought. I had no theology for thoughts. My belief about thoughts was, hey, they're in my head, that means they came from me. And that's obviously unbiblical, because the Bible says we're a vessel. Say I'm a vessel. What is the one function of a vessel? If you know, just shout it out. We're supposed to hold something. Who are we supposed to be holding? the Holy Spirit, and before we held the Holy Spirit, do you know who we held? Before we held the Holy Spirit, we held demons. Ephesians 2, 2, and 3 said we were by nature, children of wrath, we had demons working in us. I've had demons working within me. I've had 20 cast out in one experience, and it was a lot of fun because I felt a whole lot better after getting rid of 20 demons. Those things that would rise up within me and grip me and push me in negative directions like fear and terror and anger was gone. And now when I was in a threatening situation, I didn't feel something rise up and grip me and push me. I felt free. Uh, wow, those whom the sun sets free are free. So uh, 
I was thrilled to go through deliverance and have a bunch of demons cast out. And if you've got stuff that rises up within you and grips you and pushes you in a negative, negative direction, by all means, go through some deliverance. Get some deliverance prayer. Get some demons cast out. Because how many know we don't need to be gripped by negatives? We can be free. And I think everyone should press on in until they're completely free. Amen? Yeah. I mean, whatever it takes, you know. Yeah, go ahead. Give the Lord a hand if you want to. Press on in. Amen? Now, you know, to press on in for me means I'm going to go ahead and focus on the area until I get a victory. You say, well, how long does it take? I say, I don't know how long it takes. You know, to learn to hear God's voice, it took me a year to get a victory. I pressed in for one year. I had a thought come to me say, Mark, why don't you take a year of your life and learn to hear the voice of God? Now, that thought was obviously God speaking to me, but at that point I had not defined God's voice as spontaneous thoughts. So I took a year. I learned four keys, which I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes. I learned a second thing. When you're stuck, focus. And for me, I usually focus for a year. Now, focus means all my Bible meditation, all my devotional time for that year will be on, how to, in this, on, the, on the problem. In this case, it was how to hear God's voice and how to see vision. That means every book I buy in the Christian bookstore back in the resource center will be on prayer, how to hear God's voice, and how to see vision. That means every conference I go to and book myself in will be how to hear God's voice and see vision for the whole year. That means all my experimentation in my Christian life will be on how to hear God's voice and see vision. That's what it means to focus. And the Bible encourages focus. It says, look intently. Say, look intently. And then say this, not being a forgetful hearer, but an effective doer. Because how many of you know being a forgetful hearer doesn't help you at all? Amen? And so I say, well, how can I, you know, I mean, I hear all these great sermons up here, you know. How can I go beyond just hearing them to be an effective doer? And God says, look intently. That's in James. Look intently. I call it focus. So um, I encourage that to everyone. I encourage focus. Uh, I take one year of my life to focus on whatever. So when I needed my heart healed up, I took a year and focused on it. We wrote a book called Prayers That Heal the Heart. They have it in the resource center. Got all the demons out, and I've kept them out for 12 years. <laughs> I mean, no, keeping them out is just as good as getting them out. Amen? You know, because that wasn't the first time I've been through deliverance. I've been through deliverance earlier, years earlier, but I sucked a bunch of demons back because life slapped me up, and I decided to put some walls up, defenses up, and have some ungodly beliefs and uh, bitter root vows, and demons said, I can help you with those, and so I sucked a bunch back in again. So uh, to keep them out for 12 years is just as good as to get them out. Amen? Yeah, so focus intently. And if you're struggling, you're not free, I'd say focus intently on the area you're, you're, you're battling with until you're free. Figure it a minimum of three months, and if that's not enough, take um, I just finished two years on health again. Uh, we've, I spent a year or two on health back a number, when I hit 40. Now that I hit 40, we just, 60, now that I hit 40. Now that I hit 60, we just spent two more years on health. And we're, another book's going to come out in the next week on what we've learned about health in the last two and a half years. So. Some topics I spend two or three years on. Some topics I go back and spend two more years on. But you know what? I'm healthier today than I was at 30. Or 40. Or 50. I'm healthier today. Now, how many know that's decent? How many know that's definitely worth a couple years of focus? Amen? Because it gives us a chance to go ahead and fulfill our destiny and not blow up before we fulfill our destiny. Amen? Yeah, go ahead. You can give the Lord a hand. That'd be fine. Hallelujah! How many think everyone deserves to focus on health for a minimum of a year to, make, to take care of themselves? Amen? It is your responsibility. It's not the government's. It's not the church's. It's your responsibility to give God a good place to live here. So, so I believe in focus intensely, and I focus intently on areas that I struggle with, I battle with until I'm free. And I, help, I enjoy helping other people. We write books, Four Keys to Hearing God's Voice, so that's how we got free. We do DVD series. I'm working with a lady right now who's probably got splintered personality. She does, because she grew up with ritual abuse and horrific childhood. I don't know, can God put that back together and heal that? We are teaching her how to journal, and she's getting sentences out about this long before she goes right back into speaking negatives. <laughs> I'm emphatic with her, don't let any word out of your mouth that did not come from the Bible or from the Holy Spirit through journaling. Everything else you say, you are cursing yourself, so stop talking. I've only told her that 25 times. And I will not tell it to another 25 times until she gets it, all right? Because, uh, I believe she can be healed, amen? 
We're going to work on it and get in her heel. Maybe we'll have her someday share a testimony, write a book, whatever. All right, so uh, four keys to hearing God's voice. That year that I set aside to learn to hear God's voice, God taught me four simple keys. I've taught them for 30 years all over the world to children and adults on six continents. It works for everyone. We get a 100% success rate, and I'm going to get that tonight. So you're going to learn to hear God's voice. Say, I'm going to hear God's voice tonight. Okay, and you will need paper and pencil, so you definitely have to have that, all right? Check out your neighbor, make sure they have paper and pencil. We're going to take notes. We're going to do four keys to hearing God's voice right now. I'll teach on them very briefly. We will try it, experiment, make it a workshop. Because you know what? When I go to church, I want a living encounter with a living God. I don't want to hear about him. I want to meet him. Okay, so we're going to do it. I'll teach about it. We'll do it. And um, we'll share our journaling together. And then afterwards, we'll have prayer lines too. For those who want to touch from God, that'll be great too. All right? So, four keys. Can we go forward to PowerPoint? Uh, Habakkuk, or Habakkuk is a man who can hear the voice of God. He's a prophet in the Old Testament. He did four specific things to hear the voice of God. He said, I'm going to go to my guard post. I'm going to keep watch to see what the Lord's going to speak to me. And the Lord said, record the vision. Now, in those two verses are four keys. The Lord woke me up one morning, the only day in my entire life I've ever heard a boom booming bass voice. He said, get up. I'm going to teach you to hear my, my voice. This was halfway through that year. I'm learning to hear his voice. He taught me what's in these two verses. Let's go forward to PowerPoint. And uh, why don't you take notes if you've got paper and pencil uh, on one side of your sheet of paper and then the other side we're going to save to practice hearing God's voice and try some journaling, see how well it works. Key number one is in that phrase, I'm going to stand on my guard post. One more PowerPoint. Key number one is that you would have a place where you could go and quiet yourself down in the Lord's presence. You can call it a soaking room. You can call it a prayer closet. You can call it a living room couch, sofa, kitchen sink where you peel potatoes, any place you know enough to quiet yourself down to hear God's voice. If you kind of knew that you were supposed to still yourself if you wanted to hear God's voice, would you say amen? amen? Half of my head knew that. The other half of my head believed something different. The other half of my head said, don't you dare still your mind because if you do, guess who could move upon it? <laughs> if you've heard, would you tell me? The devil. So one half of me is saying, mind becomes still. The other half is saying, don't you dare become still. Satan will get you. How many know with that kind of inner tension, it's going to be difficult to still my mind because I'm not totally convinced it's right to still my mind. Is it right to still your mind or is it wrong to still your mind? I think it's right. Psalms 46.10, if you want to put it in the margin next to number one. Psalms 46.10, be still and what? Know that I am God. David in Psalm 62 says, be silent, my soul. He talks to his soul, says, shh. So if, if David can command his soul to become silent, I can command my mind to become silent too, without fearing Satan. I hate fear. I was a mighty man of fear for 20, 30, 40 years of my life. Made me so sick I couldn't stand myself. I just was trained to fear. I had a friend call me up from Florida just a few months ago and say, you need to watch this video series. My whole church is watching it. Our home groups are watching it. You need to watch it. I said, why do I have to watch it? It'll make you afraid. <laughs> I said, I spent 30 years overcoming fear. You think I want to watch a video that's going to make me afraid? I don't think so. I have already tried fear. It makes me sick. Because how many know fear is nothing more than faith in reverse? It's me believing in the power of evil and the power of Satan to rule rather than the power of the living Christ to rule. And man, that's, that's a lie because how many know the Most High rules in the realm of mankind? Say it with me. The Most High rules in the realm of mankind and he puts over it whoever he wills. The heart of the king is like channels of the water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wants. I'm not going to fear. No, I... I you know, once in a while I backslide. I think it's important to backslide once in a while so you can just taste how bad it really is when you're not walking with God, you know. About a year and a half ago, I'm looking at Washington, D.C., and fear struck me. I said, they're spending out of control. We're now $16 trillion in debt. That's over 100,000 people in dollars in debt per every American citizen. Okay, I said, they, they could collapse the entire system. They have no sense of responsibility at all. They, made me, they make me afraid. And they make me mad. And I realized, now Mark, <laughs> fear and anger are not actually two gifts of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so I said, okay, fine. I, I, I know what causes emotions. 
I don't know if you know, but I know. Emotions are byproducts of pictures. Would you say that with me? Emotions are byproducts of pictures. Now, it took me a good 20 years before I could spit that out of my mouth because I had no idea what produced emotions. I just know they were all over the place all the time. They're not anymore. They're carefully guided now because I select the pictures I look at to make sure they produce nice emotions. Obviously, I'm looking at a very nasty picture because I got fear and anger. Well, I'm looking at Washington. I'm seeing corrupt politicians. I am not seeing God. Anyone know if God's anywhere near Washington, D.C.? Yeah, he's Emmanuel, God with us. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I said, Lord, I'm in my morning devotions, realizing I'm backslidden and need some help. I said, Lord, would you show me where you are in Washington? I looked for a vision. Now, vision is one of the keys here. It's actually the next key. Can we go ahead and turn to the next key here? Key number two, I'm going to keep watch to see. All right, one more PowerPoint, please. Look for vision as you pray. See, I never used to look for vision when I prayed. I'd never crossed my mind to look for vision. I just, it never crossed my mind. Nobody suggested to me, Mark, look for vision. Now, when we worship here this morning, this evening, how many of you looked for vision, looked up into the throne room, saw the throne room, saw the people worshiping and dancing? How many did that with the eyes of your heart? Would you wave your hand at me if you did that tonight? Come on, wave your hand if you did that tonight. All right, now that is criminal. That's enough to make me cry, all right? Absolutely enough to make me cry. You've got eyes in your heart, and you're not using them to enter into the spirit realm. Probably because no one taught you to. Well, I'm going to teach you to tonight. If I come back in six months, and then I ask you, and your same group is here, and you haven't done it, I'm going to beat you up in Christian love, all right? I mean, I never looked for vision, and, and because I never looked for vision, you want to take a wild guess how many visions I used to get? <laughs> None. Because we have not because we... Ask now. Well, I looked for vision tonight. I saw the people worshiping before the throne room. I worshiped. I entered in. I saw the power. I saw the glory. What's the vision look like? Well, when I was looking for Washington, D.C., I said, Lord, morning devotions, Lord, how do you see Washington, D.C.? A picture came and lit upon my mind. Say that phrase with me. A picture came and lit upon my mind. You say, well, you know, did it have a big... Uh, did, like, did you fall down or anything, and did you shake or tremble? I said, no. I mean, it's okay to fall down and shake and tremble, but how many of you know you don't have to do that to get a vision? It's a possibility. You might, but you don't have to. Jesus saw visions how much of the time? Do you know? He said, I only do those things which I see the Father doing. How often is he seeing vision? All the time. He's not falling down all the time. He's standing up, receiving pictures, and ministering them. So for me, that's what I want to do. I want to stand up, see pictures, and release them. So I said, Lord, show me how you see Washington, D.C. And into my mind floats a picture, spontaneous flowing picture that lights up my mind of Jesus enthroned on a throne above Congress and the White House, his robes flowing down over Congress and the White House, his glory flowing down over it. That's what I see. Now, how many know that's a nice picture? Yeah, you can give the Lord a hand for that, too, if you want to. How many know that picture produces another set of emotions, no longer fear and anger, but now confidence and faith? Amen? Amen. I just went from a mean, miserable, fearful, angry person to a child of faith, not because anything there changed, but my perspective. I looked in the spirit realm, so I took the eyes of my heart, looked for vision, got it, and said, yes, Lord, I believe that's true. The Most High rules the realm of mankind. You rule over Washington, and I speak the rulership of the Most High God over Washington, D.C. I speak that righteousness be exalted. I speak that wickedness be removed in Jesus' name. Now, that's called praying, where you, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the Greek, it's the imperative mood. It's a command mood. I command righteousness rule in our nation's capitals in Jesus' name. I command wickedness be removed in Jesus' name now, in Jesus' name. Either repent or be removed in Jesus' name. That's how I know to pray. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. These are commands. You see... You said you start your prayer out not by looking at Washington or not by looking at your health problem. You start your prayer out by saying, Our Father who art in heaven. So you start your prayer out with your eyes clearly fixed, not on your need or Washington, your eyes clearly fixed on God. And you declare what you see. Hallowed be thy name. You are holy, you are righteous, you are almighty God, you are king of kings, you are lord of lords, you are ruler of all. Declare it. You are my healer. 
There is no sickness in you, in, in, you in, the, in your kingdom. You are my healer. I speak healing to every cell of my body. Be healed right now in Jesus' name. Now that's how he taught us to pray. He said, you don't start with your need. You get your eyes on me. You see me. You see my kingdom. And you command it to earth. So you speak to your body and say, body, function normally. Cells, function normally. Righteousness, be restored. Now that's the way I think we should pray. If you agree, say amen. amen. Say, Lord, teach me to pray this way. Because how many know when the church prays this way, we can change our world, amen? And, and that's how many know that's, a, that's God's full intention that we lead and not follow. We lend and no borrow. We're above and not beneath, amen? So that's a vision. So that's a vision. God gave me a vision. It changed my emotions. I like knowing that my emotions are byproducts of pictures. And if I don't like the emotions I've got, I can ask God for divine pictures to replace my demonic pictures and untrue pictures. He'll give them to me. I can hold them and have a whole new set of emotions instantaneously. How valuable do you think that information is to me? Man, I love it. I love it because I had 20, 30 years of my life. I didn't know that. And my emotions controlled me, but now they don't. Now I control them. That's priceless. So learn to use vision all the time, everywhere. My, my wife's mom died uh, in the last two years. And my wife's mom, she was a noble character, noble lady. And um, just was noble. That was the number one word for her. But the last few months of her life, she was in shriveled up in pain, like 87 pounds, in a nursing home, losing her mind, tremendous pain, couldn't remember her three daughters' names. And as she died, that's the picture that my wife Patty saw of her mom, shriveled up in pain and, and lost her mind. Well, that's not noble. And that picture that Patty saw of her there in that nursing home produced great pain inside of her heart. Well, before the funeral, three days later, Patty knows enough to ask for vision. She knows enough to worship with vision. She, she, said, I can't even, she said, Mark, I can't even imagine how a person can worship without using vision. I said, when I poll congregations, less than 20% use vision. It's heart rendering because we've used vision for 30 years. And I can hardly conceive that 30 years later, especially a renewal church like this, doesn't know enough to use vision when they worship, especially this kind of worship. So anyway, she's... Before the funeral, she's asking the Lord, Lord, what can you show me to heal my heart? And the Lord showed her a vision of heaven. Her mom was in heaven with her dad. Her dad had died a few years earlier. And they were in the prime of their life, together in a field, dancing in the field in great joy, great health, and great peace. How many of that picture produces a whole new set of emotions for Patty? And now she said, Mark, she said, when you have her share this story, she said, make sure you tell people this. You've got to choose to look at the right picture if you want to maintain the healing. Because she could revert and go back to seeing her mother shriveled up in pain, or she can look at the new picture, which is where her mother's really at, of her dancing together in the field at heaven. How many know you select the right picture, you're going to be okay? You select the wrong picture, you're still going to be a wreck, even though God offered you healing. So I said, yep, I'll teach him that. You always look at the new picture, all right? Never the old picture, all right? We got a young guy here. You were in class the last two days. This journey came out of class the last two days, right? Yesterday, I believe it was. He's bragging. He's bra God's bragging about you to his angels. Why don't you just hold that picture forever? God brags about me. How many know if you hold that picture, you're going to feel a little bit better than if you hold Satan's picture about you? Because Satan's picture about you is you're a lousy, no good, miserable sinner. And how many of you know if you hold that picture, you're not going to hold your head up very high at all. But if you take the picture that God gave to you and you hold that and say, God brags about me, <laughs> takes my breath away, you can live in confidence and joy. Now Patty's mom was doing something in heaven with her husband that she never did on earth. She was dancing. Because the church she went to didn't believe you could dance and get to heaven. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that uh, you can go to heaven and do stuff the church down here didn't allow you to do it all? <laughs> that probably lets you know a few things, all right? We could just lighten up on some of the rules a little bit. It's okay. It's not all that important. Just cool it just a little bit, all right? All right. Dancing in heaven. Yay. All right.
our newest book, which is going to come out this next week too. If you sign up for our newsletter, you'll, get, you'll hear about it. It's called When Heaven Touches Earth. It's 140 pages long. It's got stories and theology in it about, it's got Patty's story in all right, how about her mom? And it's got lots of other stories because Protestants have a hard time with heavenly encounter. You know, because if you think theologically kind of about what happened, it's kind of like communion with the saints, you know, or communion with the dead even, you know, because some people would say, well, you can't see your mother or meet with your mother in heaven because that's called communion with the dead. I remember once 15 years ago when I was wrestling with one of Paul's letters here and I was trying to understand what in the world he was saying. And I was praying about it, and the Lord just had me talk to Paul. <laughs> Paul just showed up in the screen inside my mind, and he talked to me and explained what he was writing. I thought, well, that's exciting. So I wrote about it in my book, Naturally Supernatural, and I said, Paul told me this, and man, guess how well that went over. <laughs> Within days, I was called a heretic and thrown on the carpet under the bus and said, you can't put that in your book because you can't meet with Paul because that's called communion with the dead, that communion with the dead and that's a sin forbidden in scripture. And so being a coward and a mighty man of fear, as I've already mentioned to you that I was back then, I immediately retracted, pulled it out of my book and rewrote it and didn't tell him that Paul told it to me, I just said I got it from the Lord, all right? So uh, still put the truth in there, just didn't tell where it came from, all right? Well, you know what, if you start asking people about heavenly encounters, you're going to find out many, many, many people, 20, 30, 40 percent of the people, have heavenly encounters where they have met people who've gone on before, dialogue with them, talk with them, chatted with them, and are scared to death to share it with anybody because people will attack them for it. Just like I was scared and I pulled it out. Well, our new book says, to hell with fear. <laughs> All right? It came from hell, send it back. And when you go ahead and meet with have people gathered before the throne room, Jesus and the saints and anybody who want, he wants to introduce you to, that is not communion with, with the dead. That is communion with the saints who are before the throne and it's mediated by Jesus Christ and it's completely different from the forbidden sin of conversing with the dead. So have confidence and go boldly to the throne of grace in time of need and receive. Because I didn't even, you know, I backed away. I backed away out of fear and I hate backing away out of fear because I hate fear but I had done it anyway. And so we wrote a book. I was scared to write the book, so it wasn't over all my fear. I emailed John and said, John, what do you think about this? Because I'd been attacked just one too many times. I was ticked off. In January, I was here at Breakforth Canada on the other coast in January of this last year, this year, whatever, I don't know, one of these years. And a lady asked if I could pray for her. She came up out of the conference because she needed inner healing prayer. And I said, sure. I mean, I'm here. Why not pray, you know? So we went to the prayer room and a couple of prayer counselors joined with us and we prayed and she had this issue with her mom who was dead and she repented and she forgave her and Jesus showed up, introduced her to her mom in heaven, let her talk to her mom in heaven and it was really healing to her heart. Of course, I got reported in to the to the people in leadership and they called me up and said, did you actually have someone talking to their dead relative? I said, they're not a dead relative, they're alive before the throne of God. And as long as Jesus was there, they were okay. But I was just so sick and tired of being called on the carpet every time this happens that I decided to write a book on it. I was scared to death, but I wrote the book anyway. I, I, I emailed John and said, John, you think I should do this because you can only die for one cause, you know? And, <laughs> Because once you're dead, you're dead, you know? And, and, and John, he chose what his cause would be that he would die for. He was going to die to allow the manifestations of the Holy Spirit to run free in the congregation. All right? And because he did that, because he did that, he got kicked out of the Vineyard Church, all right? And the reason he did that is because years before this revival hit, he had another revival in his youth group, and there was wild, woolly manifestations, and it scared him. And so, I guess we're all full of fear, aren't we? So uh, he shut the manifestations down and the revival came to an end. So he made a promise to God, to God, if you ever give me a revival again, I will not shut the manifestations down. And so he did. So he gave his life for allowing wild, woolly, crazy manifestations <laughs> that right-brainers love to do a lot. And left-brainers look at you and say, <laughs> you really are interesting, aren't you? Okay, so I'm a left-brainer in case you're wondering, okay? 
I don't mind that you do wild woolly stuff, just don't draw me into all of it, okay? Because, I mean, I'm okay the way I am, but it's okay. I'm okay for you to be the way you are, too. It's fine, all right? So John said to me, Mark, you know, I said, John, I could only give my life for one thing. He said, Mark, I think you're supposed to give your life for this cause because you teach that you're supposed to use the eyes of your heart in prayer and see vision. This is an extension of the four keys that you teach. I said, yes, I understand that. I realize that. And he said, I'll endorse the book. So he endorsed the book. He's, and and, and um, to help spread the blame around, we got five co-authors, so it's not just my name on it. There's five people. So we can all get beat up roy you know, royally or whatever. And I felt the Lord said, let's make it a prophetic gesture for Protestantism. And let's get 95 signers, just like we had 95 the uh, thesis on the Wittenberg door with Martin Luther, and it inaugurated the Protestant Reformation. How about if we get 95 Christian leaders to sign on to this book and say, we read the whole 140-page book, and we believe it's God. So now we've got leaders all across several nations declaring it's God. A step forward for Protestantism to say this is not communing with the dead. This is communion with the saints, which is A-OK. -okay. We got all 95 signers. Give the Lord a hand. Amen? All 95 signers. John is one of them. Praise God. All right? And a lot of leaders from across a couple of nations. So uh, a prophetic gesture. Call us forward to come boldly before the throne in grace. Now, when I was using vision, what I have been doing is picturing Jesus here with me. And when we journal tonight, I'll probably take you for a walk with Jesus and paint a scene where you picture Jesus there with you or you go for want to see a Galilee or whatever. But one of the guys that I taught these four keys to, Mike Rogers, he's one of the co-authors of the book, he taught his church something different. He said, you know, when you're using vision, you're actually seated with Christ in heavenly places. Right? He said, why don't we go and use that picture and go there instead of, I mean, he is here, he's everywhere, he's Emmanuel, God with us, but we could go there. And so he teaches his congregation to go to heaven and to knock at any door they find and see if Jesus wants to open it. And so I went down to his church to teach in the four keys and uh, he sat down to a little prayer session with me. He said, come on, Mark, let's go to heaven now. I said, okay, whatever, you know. So we went to heaven. He said, why don't you look around? I said, okay, I'm looking. Uh, what do I see? He said, what do you see? He said, oh, I think I see a... Yeah, I think you're right. I think I see a door. He said, okay, why don't you knock on it? Okay, I knocked on it. Jesus opened it. He said, now what do you see? I said, oh, I see a beautiful field. And he just kept asking me, what do you see? What do you see? And because I kept looking, I kept seeing. Would you please say, if you keep looking, say, if I keep looking, I will keep seeing. And the vision will extend. And I can watch a five-minute vision. Because I look for five minutes. You know, so I've said, you know what, I've never done this, and I really should have. Because the Bible is crystal clear that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, and I accepted it as theology, but I never wrestled with it practically and said, I'm going to go there and live there and see what's going on there. How many believe there's a ton of resources in heaven that God would like to make available to us if we go up there and ask for them and begin to use them? Amen? But I was too afraid, so I hate fear. Say, I hate fear. I bind fear. Fear be gone. In Jesus' name. You have no place within me. I am a child of the King. I'm a child of faith. I believe the Bible's true in me. If God said it, I can do it. I can go into the heavenlies with Jesus, be seated there and meet those who are there. I choose to do that. I choose to live scripture. Not just think it, live it. Do it. Hallelujah! Well, man, it's just time to get there and get over fear. So the purpose of that book is let's kill fear one more time, all right? And let's move on into one more area of grace. We have a new person who blogs on our website. We have four to five people right now who do blogs. If you sign up for our blogs, you're going to get about two a day, which seems to me like a lot, but you know, they're all, mostly all journaling and vision. People share, you know, that's pretty inspirational stuff, you know? And there's one lady who I met at a Catch the Fire church in Franklin, Tennessee, one of your churches, all right? I was there about two months ago, and this, Julie, this um, Tara, I meant Julie True, and, and she's, 
She's doing a wonderful project with us right now, which is going to come out next month. And I also met Tara, and Tara sat down and had breakfast. Her girlfriend and her had breakfast with me, and she's sharing her journaling, and it's just all full of vision. I mean, she's seen Jesus. She's seen the glory cloud above his head as a funnel that's spinning above his head. It's like the cloud of his presence, and she's playing with it, and she's grabbing some power and throwing it at people. They're getting healed. And I mean, it's just a party time. And I said, God, how come I never seen the glory cloud? He said, because you never looked. Shoot myself in the foot one more time. God, I'm sorry for not looking. I mean, the cloud of your presence is throughout Scripture. I know it's there. I've started looking for the glory cloud, and guess what? I see it. You know, folks? And you say, what do you mean? You see it. Well, I see it. I see it. I see a picture. It lights up my mind. There's a cloud above Jesus when I'm there with him. Sure enough, it's there. So if we start looking, we get to see. And you say, well, how do you know for sure it's God? Well, if it's in the Bible, that's a good indication we're moving in the right direction. All right? Amen? And you take and you submit it to your three spiritual advisors, too. Those are the two things I know to do is, is say, hey, is this experience in the Bible? If it is, I'm probably in the right track. I'm going to submit it to my three advisors and say, hey, here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I'm feeling. And do you feel it's God? And you say, well, I'm not sure if I got three advisors. I want to say, well, get your three advisors. You say, yeah, but there's, no three, there's not three perfect people. I say, I understand. I've been taken, so you know, we're down to two now, all right? So um, <laughs> how many know there are no perfect people, and God knew that when he said in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact gets confirmed, amen? So I said, no, God, I don't confirm stuff with two or three witnesses. I confirm stuff with the brilliance of my theology. God said, did I say to do that? I said, you must have. I've been doing it all my life. He said, check. So I looked. You want to look up the word theology in the Bible and tell me how many times it shows up? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I said, that's too bad. I'm a theologian. <laughs> and it doesn't even show up once. Dear me, dear me. He never said, test my spiritual experiences with my reason, logic, mind, or theology. So I don't anymore. He said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Say, in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Every fact is confirmed. The word fact there is rhema in the Greek. Rhema means spoken word, every spoken word. So when God speaks into my journal, I email it out to my three advisors. And if they say it's God, then I run with it. So as long as it lines up with scripture and they say it's God, I run with it. So if I'm getting visions and I'm not sure, you say, well, how do you know it's really the glory cloud? I'm going to submit it to my three advisors. If they agree it's the glory cloud, guess what? It's the glory cloud. You say, well, you know, did, did you go blind for three days like Paul in the Damascus Road? No, I just stood right up and just watched the vision, you know. How I many know Jesus didn't go blind for three days, but he saw a vision too, amen? You say, but yeah, but don't you have to have an emotional, you know, biggie, biggie? And I said, no, I'm, I'm a cleric. I'm lucky to have any emotions, period, you know. Now, if you're a right brain space cadet, yes, emotional, that's good for you. You know, you just, wee, you know, you have a party. And I think that's fine. All right? I have no problem with a right brain or having great emotional experiences. And, and I've even got a few emotions God restored back to me. Because when I began to journal and use vision, one of the first visions I got was, he's holding my head against his chest and caressing my hair. Well, now, no man's ever done that in my entire adult life. And uh, so, I journal and God said, Mark, tenderness is okay. Because tenderness and emotion, I've cut off all emotions because I was taught emotions were soulish. Mind, will, and emotion were soulish, so cut them off, they're unreliable, blah, blah, blah. So I, I only had two to start out with, I'm a cleric, and I cut those two off, and, which means I can't even cherish my wife because cherishing is an emotion. So I didn't, I, I said, honey, I love you with agape love, and, which means I'll lay my life down. Well, if you don't cherish your wife, take a while, guess what happens to your wife? <laughs> she wilts. So my life wilted. My wife wilted. She, uh, she lost the joy of the Lord. And I said, honey, let me counsel you. <laughs> she said, drop dead. I said, oh, that's not a, good, not a good attitude. I'm your husband and your pastor, you know. Well, if I wouldn't have crushed your spirit by having really nasty theology, saying emotions were soulless, so I couldn't even cherish her. I almost wrecked my marriage with unbiblical demonic theology. God said emotions are in your spirit. Jesus moved by compassion. Say moved by compassion. Say that's an emotion. It's in his spirit and he's, he's living out of it. Say he's living out of it. He's ministering out of it. 
I was taught you would never let emotions lead in your life. Well, they led in his life, Jesus' life. God sent Ezekiel embittered in the rage of his spirit. Say rage of his spirit. That's an emotion in the spirit placed there by God. So to believe there's not emotions in your spirit was wrong. That's why people struggle with what goes on here. Because they've been taught emotions are soulish, and so they look at this and say, it's emotionalism. I say, you only call it emotionalism because you believe emotions are soulish. If you knew emotions could be in your spirit, here's what you'd call it. You'd say, these people are picking up God's emotions, and they're radiating them forth. Yeah, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Say, I'm picking up God's emotions, and I radiate them forth. It's a spirit emotion. It's not soulish. It's not emotionalism. It's spirit emotion. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. I can live out of it, just like Jesus did. And I will. And there's no shame in that. Because I was taught to be a shame in it, too. I was taught so much error. All right? So as I journaled for a bunch of years, I ended up writing a book on 49 lies I repented of when I renounced Phariseeism. It's a hundred pages of my journaling where God said, Mark, you don't want to believe this. You don't want to live in this box. It's a prison. You want to believe this. And he lovingly, without kicking me in the head, drew me in the truth. All right? All right, so that was key number two. We got two keys down. We're going to use vision. Say, I'm going to use vision. When I worship, I will look for vision. I will go into the heavenlies. I will see the throne room. I will see the worship taking place there. I will tune to flow. I will join in with it and become a member of it. I'll participate. Thank you, Lord. All right, number three. Key number three. What he will speak to me, we're going to say one more PowerPoint. Key number three is God's voice often comes as spontaneous thoughts. Let's say it together. God's voice often comes as spontaneous thoughts. Simplest sentence in the world. I hope that you folks memorize it and speak it to thousands of people because the world needs to know it. The church, church needs to know it. The only healing for our nation is the church becoming a spirit anointed leader and putting godly people in positions of authority. And the only way that can happen, I believe, is that they live out of the voice of God. Because when God says we become the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, you know what the first verse of that chapter is? If you hear my voice. So the only way I know we can become leaders in society is if we take his voice out to the street, into Washington, and into, your capital is? Ottawa. Ottawa. I keep thinking that it ought to be Toronto, but I understand it's not. It's Ottawa. Okay, so there you go. Spontaneous thoughts. Say spontaneous thoughts. Another word there is flowing thoughts. Say flowing thoughts. How many have had a thought flow into your mind to pray for someone? If you have, say amen. amen. See, that was the voice of God. It came as a flowing thought. So when I want to, in prayer, hear God's voice, I tune to flowing thoughts. I fix my eyes on Jesus, ask him a question, tune to flowing thoughts, because flowing thoughts come from the heart. And the verse that proves that would be this. You can put it in the margin if you want to. It's John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. Jesus is talking. John 7, 37 to 39, out of your innermost being shall what? Flow. Say shall flow. Rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the Spirit. So folks, when you and I want to tune to the Spirit, according to that verse, what does the Spirit inside of you feel like? Yeah, it feels like a river of living water, which is, say, say this, he feels like flow. He feels like flow. That verse clearly says that. So it says, look, Mark, you want to touch your heart? You want to touch the Holy Spirit? You tune to flow. If I want the voice of the Holy Spirit, I tune to flowing thoughts. If I want, if I want visions, I tune to flowing pictures. If I want emotions, I tune to flowing emotions. I love being able to say that. Because for 30 years of my life, I couldn't say any of that because I didn't know any of that. Which means I couldn't walk in the Spirit because I couldn't even define it. Now I can define it. To walk in the Spirit means I fix my eyes on Jesus, tune to flow, pick up flowing thoughts, flowing pictures, flowing emotions, and live them out. That's walking in the Spirit. If I can define it, I can do it. All right. 
spontaneous thoughts. Key number four then would be, the Lord says, record the vision. One more PowerPoint. So record means write it down, write it out. Take your pencil and paper and write out the flow of thoughts and pictures within you. And we're going to call that two-way journaling. Now, this whole idea of writing out my prayer time <laughs> struck me as a bad idea. <laughs> because I hate English, grammar, spelling, and writing. I flunked English. I took remedial English in college. I pretty much flunked it there, but they didn't want to keep me there forever, so they just, you know, passed me on through anyway, okay? And I said, God, this is a bad idea. Now, I think when God has a bad idea, you can let him know, and then when he rewrites the book, he can fix it, all right? I said, I don't want to write my prayers out. And God says, well... Who's Lord? You or me? I said, well, you're Lord, but, you know, I still think we can improve the system. He said, Mark, would you practice yes, Lord? Would you practice that with me? Yes, Lord. Come on, one more time. Yes, Lord. You don't sit there in the wine and say, I don't think I want to do that. You say, yes, Lord. One more time. Yes, Lord. If you sit there and whine, how many know that's equivalent to shooting yourself in the foot and setting yourself back? I mean, God doesn't give you instructions so he can wreck your life. He gives you instructions so you can move forward. Amen? I said, fine, God. You know what? I'm going to try journaling to prove to you it's not going to work in my case. <laughs> now, if I was God, I'd have just kicked me in the head right then, but he's much nicer than I am. So, uh, so I quieted myself down, fixed my eyes on Jesus, asked him a question which I wrote down, and I tuned to flow, and I got a paragraph from flow written down. A whole paragraph. I thought, ha, huh, look at that, whole paragraph. I took it to my wife, Patty, and said, Patty, would you read it? She read it, and she said, I believe that's God. I said, really? She said, really? Take a while, guess what that did to my faith level? It went up. How many need your faith level in flow to go up? Because no one taught me to have faith in flow ever. Not in high school, not in college, not in Bible college. No one said, have faith in flow. Say, have faith in flow. Say, flow is the river of God within you, within me, it flows within me, it's real, it's alive, it begins in the throne room of heaven, it flows into my heart, when I invite Jesus into my life, and it flows out through any faculty that I present to the river. And when I present that faculty to the, to the river, I'm anointed in that area. At that point in time, folks, say this, if I speak from flow, I'm speaking the oracles of God. If I think in flow, it's the mind of Christ. If I have flow in emotions, it's divine emotions. I choose to live in flow. I choose to be anointed. It's better than living out of self. I choose to be like Jesus, who only did what he heard and saw. I choose that lifestyle. Holy Spirit, draw me into it. And don't let me rest until that's where I live. You know, when I went to school and college, no one was trying to teach me to be anointed. That was not their purpose or their goal. They were trying to teach me self-actualization, which was fine, except for it's the opposite of Christianity, because Christianity is dying daily, coming alive to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So it was pretty much the wrong direction, all right? I stepped out of the Western worldview and the Western educational process. We have our own university, which will, Christian Leadership University. We say, we'll put the voice of God in the center of every course. You'll hear God's voice and respond to it. It's the only university in the world that I know that does that. Over a hundred courses that do it. Students in 120 nations. And that's performing beyond my ability. And folks, I want you to know that if you listen to the voice of God and live out of it, you'll perform your beyond your ability. I planned on milking cows in Lauville, New York, which would have been fine, but we've got students in 120 nations. 6,000 students. And we're getting started. We're going to have a million. Because I'm going after a million dollar advertising budget, we're going to have a million students, all right? That's why I've just spent two more years uh, working on health, because I want to live long enough to fulfill my destiny. I want another 30 years of vibrant health, all right? And I, and I can get it. And so can you, all right? 
Okay, so key number four is to journal, to write out the flow. So I, my wife said that that paragraph was God. I had increased faith. I went back and did the four keys again. I quieted myself down, fixed my eyes on Jesus, tuned the flow, and wrote another paragraph. I took that to Patty. She said, I still believe it's God. <laughs> my faith went up. I did that all morning, every half hour going to Patty, and she kept saying it was God. In the afternoon, I journaled for an hour to crack, took it to Patty. She said, it's God. At the end of the day, I had five hours of written stuff where God talked to me for five hours straight. <laughs> if you would consider that a breakthrough, would you say breakthrough? This is a guy who has not identified the voice of God for the first 10 years of his Christian life, and he just wrote for five hours. Because I used four keys at one time. And I said, God, could you help me understand this? I thought journaling was going to wreck my prayer time, and instead it just released five hours of you talking. He said, Mark, here's why. Because when you used to come to me and ask me to speak, and I would begin to speak, and a thought would light upon your mind, you would instantly go into, hmm, I wonder if that came from God. Anyone here go do the old hmm thing? Now, hmm is what? Do you know what hmm is? It is doubt. And those who come to God must come in what? Faith believing. Hebrews 11, 1 to 6. I come in faith believing for two seconds. I go straight to hmm. And God says, you know, Mark, it's really hard to have a relationship with you. Every time I start talking, you hang up. I said, I'm so afraid of being deceived by the New Age movement. He said, you could trust me for five minutes. I said, I never thought of that. How many believe God can be trusted to keep you for five minutes, or 10, or 15, and he can probably do a better job than you can with your own theology? As a matter of fact, in one of my journal entries, my journal entries, he said this. He said, Mark, you can trust my voice in your heart more than you can trust the reason theology of your mind. Ha! Well, I said, that's a demon talking for sure. Because I even got a verse, I got a verse to disprove that. Because the Bible says my heart is evil and desperately wicked. So there's no chance I can trust a voice in an evil, desperately wicked heart to be better than my theology. God said, Mark, that's not your heart that's evil and desperately wicked. I've given you a new heart and a new spirit. And it's not evil and it's not desperately wicked. You're a partaker of the divine nature. You are joined to the Holy Spirit. You are pure gold at the core of your being. You are one with me. And he said, you can trust my voice more than you can trust your reason theology. Now, if I say yes to that, it radically changes the way I live my life because I've always lived it head first, theology first, up to that point in life. And God says, you can live it heart first. You can tune the flow, and if flow says it's good, you can go with it. As a theologian, I switched. I now live heart first. It scared me to death for a while, which is why I'm glad I got three people to See, my theology doesn't keep me safe. The three people I submit my journey to keeps me safe. You say, yeah, but I don't think I can submit to three people. I said, you have to. Because if you don't, you can never fulfill your destiny. You say, why not? Because God has chosen to minister His grace to you through the body of Christ. And if you can't be humble enough and meek enough, Moses was the meekest man in the face of the earth. The body, Jesus said, blessed are the meek. If you can't be meek enough to receive input from other people who are imperfect, you cannot receive the fullness of God's grace. There is no project I've worked on for 30 years I've done alone. No book I've written I've done alone. All right? It's always a team effort. Because how many of you know we look through one set of eyes and three other people look through three different sets of eyes, three different heart motivations, and when you get all those heart motivations pooled together, you have a much fuller Christ than if you only got one heart motivation. My heart motivation is a teacher. If I team up with a prophet, an apostle, an evangelist, and a pastor, I'm going to have a nicer book. It'll have some love in it. It won't just teach you, it'll actually care about you. It might even have some sales sizzle, because the evangelist said, sell the truth, you know? I said, I think if I declare it, that's good enough. No, you got to sell it. Well, if I can get all five voices from the five-fold ministry into the book, it's going to be better than if it's just my voice in the book. I noticed when I journaled that uh, God didn't tell me everything. I noticed when other people brought their journey to me, He didn't tell them everything. I said, why not? And God said, Mark, if I told you everything you needed, and I gave it directly to you in your journal, you would not need other people in the body of Christ. And if you didn't need them, you would splinter. I said, you better believe it. I'm out of here. Because <laughs> people hurt me. They slap me up and they put me down and I get hurt and I don't want to be hurt, so I'm going to Alaska. 
I told him that. When I was 23 or 4, I was so wounded by the church. I said, I'm going to Alaska. He said, don't go to Alaska. I said, why not? He says, because uh, there's no people there. I said, that's the goal. You know, he said, how, about, how can you save the world if there's no people there? I said, fine, then I want you to promise me something that if I stay in relationship with people, they'll never hurt me again. <laughs> he said, Mark, I will promise you something. He said, I promise you that if you stay in relationship with people, that they will hurt you. <laughs> I said, thank you, Jesus, I receive it. I also promise that I'll be standing right next to you and you can turn to me and I'll heal the hurt on the spot. Yeah, amen. So my promise isn't that you're not going to hurt me, you will, but I'm going to hurt you, it's just part of who we are, that's okay. But he's there, we can turn to him, and I'll say, Lord, how do you see this? And I'll look for vision, I'll see what Jesus is doing with you, how he's responding to you, and I'm transformed while I look. Not at things which are seen, but things which are not seen. I see Jesus hugging you, I decide to hug you. He said, Mark, here's the prophetic word for you for this period of your life. Honor all people, love all people, forgive all people. I said, man, that's sure different than I used to do. We used to judge them, kick them, and spit at them, okay? So, because um, I grew up in a church that did that and taught me to do that, and I was pretty good at it, really good at it, actually, all right? Okay, that's it. That's four keys. Now, I have a promise for you. If you use all four keys at one time, you can hear God's voice every single day of your life. I guarantee it. So you need paper and pencil? We're going to try it. So grab your paper, grab your pencil. We're going to do a workshop right now as we close, I guess. Wow, it's only 9.30. I could go further, couldn't I? I can go longer. Wow. Well, that's okay. Now, tomorrow, say, if you, hey, if you need paper and pencil, get your hand up, all right? There's still some paper here, and somebody will get you paper and pencil. But tomorrow, uh, or just come and grab some paper and pencil if, if you need it. We're going to work our way through this seminar guide. It's going to be for sale outwards, afterwards in the 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. We're starting at 9, no worship, just jumping right in, no rambling. I'm going to start teaching at 9, all right? I'm done rambling. I'm going to be a methodical, left brain boring teacher all day tomorrow, so come and be bored spitless, all right? Okay, wonderful offer. You can't hardly beat it. So get one of these, and we'll work our way through it. We will cover the four keys in depth. Say in depth. All we did is introduce them now. I'd like you to own them so they're yours, so there's, you breathe them, eat them, sleep them, and you just live out of them naturally. So nine, 9 to 5. Probably be done by quarter to 5. 9 to quarter to 5. Take a lunch break at 12.30 to 2. Do a book signing from 1 to 2. A lot of good books over there in the Resource Center. And I will sign books, and you can come and uh, I'll sign the books, and they're worth twice as much after I sign the book. That way you can sell them for twice as much, make some money, praise God. So it's a great chance to make money, all right? So uh, come tomorrow. I would love to see you. Get a seminar guide. We'll work our way through it. All right, four keys to hearing God's voice. All right, so uh, you've all got paper and pencil. I'd like you to try this with me. I'd like you to write down a question on the top of the page. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a choice to go a couple different directions here. All right, here's a couple of questions. Write them down and you can select any one you want to here. Uh, I'll just tell you three different questions. You can write down the one that hits your fancy. Question one would be, Lord, uh, what do you want to say to me? Question two, Lord, how do you see me? Question three, Lord, do you love me? So write down the one that you would like to ask the Lord. Lord, what do you want to say to me? Lord, how do you see me? Lord, do you love me? Write down one of those three questions. Lord, what do you want to say to me? How do you see me? And Lord, do you love me? So pick one of those three questions, if you will. Lord, what do you want to say to me? How do you see me? Do you love me? And I would like to lead us in a prayer time and a journaling time. Father, we thank you for this place. We thank you there's an open portal in the heavens where your presence is felt and tasted and it's easily available. And Holy Spirit, we ask right now that you would anoint our eyes that we might see Jesus here with us. We ask that you would anoint our ears that we might hear his voice as spontaneous flowing thoughts. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you grant each one of us access before the throne of grace. And Lord, we come boldly before the throne of grace, receiving, hearing, and seeing. I'd like you to see a picture in your mind's eye of you and Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee on a beautiful, warm summer day. 
As you walk along the seashore, you can see the hillside of Galilee, with green grass blowing gently in the breeze. As you look out across the surface of the water, you can see the sparkling surface with the sun dancing and reflecting off from it. Way out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee is a fisherman in a boat. He's just spending some time alone with his creator. And as you look up into the sky, you can see a very soft blue sky. And some soft white clouds are drifting lazily by. And you can feel the sun just warming you all the way through as you walk along with Jesus. You can feel a gentle warm breeze blowing against your back. And as you look over at Jesus, you can see his long flowing white robes. And there's sandals on his feet. And a gentle, loving countenance. Just reaching out to you. Engulfing you in his love, his joy. You might find that you become a small child as you're there with him. If that happens, that's fine. You might put your hand in his hand as you walk along. If that happens, that's fine. Let's just tune to flow for a moment. Holy Spirit, we ask that you take this scene over. Just tune to flow and watch, let it come alive. Watch what Jesus does. And as you're there with Jesus, I would like you to ask him the question that you have underlined and say, Lord, what about this? And then just fix your eyes upon Jesus. Put a big smile on your face and just say, thank you for being here. And now just tune to flow. And with your eyes fixed on Jesus, I want you to write from flow for about four or five minutes. Whatever flowing thoughts are coming to you as he speaks into your heart. And Lord, we thank you for what you speak to us. I'm going to give you about four or five minutes to be alone with Jesus and to write. We're going to write in childlike faith right now, and then we'll test it later on. Thank you, Lord, for what you speak. Amen.
I would like to uh, draw us back together. If you were able to write down something you felt may have come from God, would you say amen? That's good. Thank you. I want to ask us to do two things as we close. It's good to minister grace one to another. It's good to affirm one another in faith. It's good to testify. We're going to do those three things. I'm going to ask that you would team up in groups of two in just a moment. And if your journaling is not too personal and you are able to read what God said to you, I'm going to ask you to read it to a person. And if you're listening to someone read it and you feel in your heart it's God, tell them that. I didn't say your head, but if your heart bears witness, say, my heart bears witness. That came from Jesus. Now, what I'm looking for when I listen for journaling is, is, is the fruits of the Spirit in it. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, patience, kindness, faith, hope. If I feel that tender in it, I say, that's God. That's good. So I would like you to build up a person's faith by saying that to them. And then you share your journaling with them. It gives you a chance to be built up in faith. And then as far as testifying... I'm going to ask for three or four volunteers to come to the front. I'll come down. We'll get a microphone. We'll give you this microphone and let you read what the Lord said to you. So we hear what God is saying. That's testifying. All right? And um, as you share your journey with somebody else, don't paraphrase it because your paraphrase is nowhere near as good or as accurate as what God said initially. Okay? So just simply read the question you asked the Lord and then read what he said back with no stories just about four or five minutes in groups of two. And then we'll take four or five minutes with people sharing testimonies. And then we'll break out for those who might want prayer. And we'll let you form some lines and receive some prayer tonight. Find somebody who looks friendly. Smile. Tell them you're friendly. And move around if you have to to find a friendly person to share with for a few moments, all right? I'll call us back together in five minutes. <clears throat>